The history I know before me was um, a group of moms had kiddos with special needs and they needed to find a place for them. They wanted to come worship. Our first buddy break, we started with about 14 kiddos and now we average about 100. I've often said that special needs ministry is completely outside of my comfort zone. And I think that only inspired the Holy Spirit to start me on a journey. Over the last many years, I've had opportunities to serve pretty deep with those with special needs. I had an opportunity to go to Ukraine to be a part of Elisa's ministry and to be with her in the context of an orphanage with kids with special needs and an institution with men. And both of those times changed me in my core. I initially came to Ukraine on a short-term trip with a group from church, and we did an English Bible camp with a local congregation here. I came stubbornly. I did not want to come. I'd already spent time overseas, and I thought, surely, Lord, you will never take me overseas again. But he made it very clear I was supposed to come on that trip, and that's what he used to ignite the initial fire for me to come. I met the children that were bedridden, and I was introduced to them through a volunteer that was working at the orphanage. These children never get out of bed because there aren't enough people to work with them. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is what I want you to do. I'll admit it was probably the most difficult thing that the Lord has asked of me, but I said, if this is what you want, I'll do it. Those kiddos that started as, you know, 10, 12 year olds have grown now to be adults. So about two years ago, we launched what we call M Club, and that's our monthly programming for adults with special needs. Thank you for these friends of mine. The needs of someone who's 30 compared to 13 are very different. Some of them have jobs, some of them are still in the school program, but a lot of them don't have a lot of social opportunities. I thought, well, that's easy. We have lots of people here who would love the opportunity to really hang and have a good time with our adults with special needs. We have a thriving masterpiece ministry. Buddy Break was expanding, and I thought to myself, there, there's clearly an opportunity for the hearts of Chapel Street to fall in love with Elisa's grander vision, to do something for 10 men that have grown up in an institutionalized system. They've been abandoned by their family, so they've started life in an orphanage, and when they become an adult, they live in an adult institution for the rest of their life. Or they have an opportunity to move into Stephen's home. This next one is the snow room. And the snow bedroom is the one that we've completed with the anticipation that the first two young guys that will move into this room will actually be moving in hopefully within the next few months. The main goal through Stephen's home is to provide opportunities for the young men that will come into Stephen's home to become part of community. In doing so, enabling them to develop their skills, develop their minds, develop an understanding of what it means to be part of life. A home that is designed to give them a hope and a future, very similar to a Chapel Street Church that has created ministries so that families in our region would have a hope and a future in worship. They're going to be seen in a different way now that this opportunity and that this project has come about. They have a sense of community not only in their beautiful house that they've built, but can go out into the community where other people can really just see them. They've been isolated from the world for a very long time and we want to give them freedom in Stephen's home and allow them to know and learn about the love of the Lord. video because it helps connect the stories. A story happening halfway around the world in Ukraine, a story that's been happening here at Chapel Street for 
about the last decade as we've been growing in our vision for ministry to special needs families uh, through Buddy Break, through Masterpiece, and how those are connected. And it truly is a remarkable thing, um, a beautiful thing for a suburban church in North America to be developing simultaneously here with a heart for those kids and young people and young adults and in the Ukraine. So we wanted you to see that and connect that because we think that's, that's kind of what Jesus talked about when he said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So thank you for being part of that. Well, two months after my wife and I were married, way back in 1985, we went to uh, Bolivia in South America for a six-month teaching assignment at a small evangelical university. And I've told lots of stories through the years about that experience. We had all kinds of cultural experiences during those, those six months um, early in our marriage. But none, no experience is quite as unique as the story I want to recount for you today. And I can't honestly remember if I've told this before. I probably have, so you might remember it. If I told it you, I'm sure you will remember it, Um, but we were on our way to a market in some city in Bolivia. I don't remember where we were, and I noticed a commotion in the street. Uh, A crowd was gathering, and there was laughter and cheering and something going on in the street, so I I wandered over to the edge of the crowd just to see what was going on, Uh, and I peered in from the outside of the crowd, and there was a kind of a street performer in the middle of the crowd. Looked like a gypsy of some sort, really brightly colored clothes, and he was doing uh, juggling and different kinds of magic tricks and so forth. Uh, So I I worked my way a little closer to see what was going on. And then um, he took out of his little bag a hammer and two uh, big ten-penny nails, that big or maybe a little bit bigger than that. And he showed everybody what he had, and then he took the hammer and he hammered the nail into a block of wood. I'm not going to do it today because I don't want to ruin this, this little piece of furniture. But he hammered these two nails into this block of wood. So you could see, you could hear it and you could see it. Then he pulled them out, held them up again. And then, right in front of the whole crowd, he took this nail and held it up to his nostril. And he hammered this nail straight into his face. And I made the same sound some of you just made. I went, ah. Oh. The whole crowd was groaning. And then he took the other nail, and he hammered the other nail into the other nostril. Tack, 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 tack. And my, I, my eyes water every time I, I, I tell this story. And then he walked around so you could see these two little nails protruding from his nose. Like no blood, no nothing, just these nails. And then he took the hammer, and he pried these nails out of his head. I made the same sound again. <laughs> now, evidently, uh, some people have space in their sinus cavity that will allow a nail to go in there. I don't know how long it took him to find that out or how you even start to find that out, but he could do that. And I thought to myself, that might be the coolest thing I have ever seen. (laughs) Now, you may be out there going, you know, I don't have to believe that. But I'm here to tell you um, that's what I saw. I mean, I could never make that up. See, we're in the second week of a series for Advent called Light of the World, And these four weeks, we're studying just one passage from the book of John, John chapter 1, the first 14 verses. And now you've noticed, if you are here last week, that it's not a traditional Advent text. Uh, There's no star, there's no shepherds, no Mary, no Joseph, no manger. But if you look closely enough, all of it is really there in these verses from John. We began last week with the first five verses. Let me read them for you. Uh, today as we begin, and I'll review. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Those three words are where we focused last week as we began. The Word which was the Greek word logos, who the Greeks thought of as the organizing principle of all things. John is saying that's that's Jesus. He's coming to the world. Life is physical life and spiritual life. And Jesus is the source of life. And then light, light that's come in to chase the darkness from the world. And then today we're going to jump into our passage, which talks about the witness to the light. And that's our focus today, the witness to the light, beginning in verse 6. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming 
into the world. So just two things I'm going to talk about today, and that is the witness and then the message. First, let's begin with the witness. When I was in my mid-20s, um, not yet married and working my way through grad school, uh, I coached basketball for four years at uh, Taylor University. My brother Joe uh, played on that team for a couple of those years, and twice we were able to make um, a trip all the way out to California to play Biola University. And that's a big deal for a small school like Taylor to make that trip, so it was really fun. And we were able to beat them the first year. Uh, and the second year we went out to play them, uh, they had a very, very good team. In fact, that year they ended up undefeated, the only undefeated team in the country. They won the small college national championship. So, they were, we, so we knew they were going to be very good, and we knew they were going to be kind of loaded for revenge since we'd beat them the year before. But we also had heard that they were not only a good team, but they had a very unique player on their team that second year. The tallest player in the world was rumored to play for their team. His name was George Bell, and he was seven feet, eight inches tall. Uh, he is here on the left side of that picture. And just so you know, the guy, this was an article in Sports Illustrated that came out about that time. The guy to his right, looking up, is six feet seven. So just, just take a look at that. All right? Now, this was in the days before the Internet, before YouTube, so we couldn't just look up a video of this guy. It was all, we were all just hearing about him. So we made the trip. The day of the game came, and uh, all the players were excited to play Biola, but they really, really wanted to see this guy, George Bell, the tallest player in the world. Now, my brother was a, a player on that team, and before the game, you know, everybody's getting excited in the locker room, getting ready. He went into the training room that both teams used to, he was going to get his ankles taped, just what players do. And it, while he was in there, he saw, he saw a shoe sitting on a table, on a bench, size 22. Now, this is, a, this is a picture, this is not my brother, but this is a picture of a guy holding a size 22 shoe. I think that one belongs to Shaquille O'Neal. But I brought a shoe from home. This is one of my boy's shoes who wears a size 15. That's a big shoe. This shoe would fit inside that shoe. So my brother grabbed that shoe. Nobody was looking. He grabbed the shoe. It was, it was enormous. And he ran into our locker room and said, guys, Look. And it was like the story in Numbers 13, you know, when the spies come back from the promised land and they give a report of warriors of unusual size and the people's hearts melt with fear. Well, that happened and the game was effectively over <laughs> right at that moment. Uh, we got beat by 37 points and George Bell hardly played in that game. We were defeated by a shoe. All right. <laughs> Now, this is George Bell today. I found a picture. He's 60 years old. He's a sheriff's deputy in Wyoming or something, and that's, that's his boss standing on the table <laughs> next to him. So in verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So who is John the, the apostle, the writer of the Gospel of John, talking about? Well, he's talking about the man that we call John the Baptist. In that day, he was simply called the baptizer, or we might more accurately call him John the Witness. Now, John the Baptist was a big deal, a much greater figure at that time, first century Israel, than we even give him credit for today. Uh, the New Testament tells us that his birth was unique. In Luke chapter 1, we read the story, the angel Gabriel appeared to his father, Zechariah, and told him that he and his wife, Elizabeth, who was a, a cousin of sorts to Mary, the mother of Jesus, were going to have a child. Even though they'd been barren, she'd been barren, unable to have children her whole life. And that they would have a son, and that he would be great in the eyes of God, that he would lead many to turn back to the Lord their God, and that he would prepare the way for the Messiah. All that was prophesied about the Baptist's birth. Then Luke tells us he was set apart from an early age. He never drank wine or any other fermented drink. He was a preacher and a prophet in his own right. In Matthew 3, we read that the baptizer preached a powerful message of repentance from sin. And that people flocked to him by the thousands from the whole region of Jerusalem to hear him preach and to be baptized by him for repentance. He had many of his own followers, many of his own disciples. Some even thought he was the Messiah, the Christ sent from God. So everyone knew who John the Baptist was. John the writer says simply, there was a man sent from God. His name was John. 
And then he says in verse 7, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. So he came as a witness to bear witness. Now the word translated witness here is the Greek word marturion, from which we get our word martyr. It means one who bears testimony before a judge or one who testifies to historical events. So when I tell you uh, I saw a man hammer nails into his nose, I am a witness. I'm bearing witness to an event that I saw happen. Now, we can bear witness to all kinds of things, and we do. Consider this Nike ad campaign for basketball star LeBron James. This campaign was developed at the time he was rising to stardom for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Can you see what it says at the top? We are all witnesses. In fact, this poster was turned into huge murals that covered this whole size of buildings in Cleveland for years. This is a building, that same poster on it, for a basketball player. John the Baptist was sent by God, uh, John says, to bear witness to someone far, far greater. John the writer knows this, and he wants to make sure that people understand that John the Baptist was sent by God, and as great as he was, he himself was not the light. He was sent to bear witness to the light. He was sent to prepare the way. Now let me read from a little bit later on in John chapter 1, because he explains a bit further. Beginning in verse 19. And this is the testimony of John, that's the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? Likely referring to Jeremiah. And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John the Baptist answered them, I baptize with water. But but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So John the Baptist simply bore witness to what he knew, to what he had seen when he baptized Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to get there in just a minute. Here's a question for you, though. Why was a witness like John the Baptist even necessary? Why was it necessary for him to be sent by God to prepare the way? Why wouldn't God just, you know, put up billboards all over ancient Israel? I'm coming. You're not going to miss it. It's going to come in a really unusual way. Why wouldn't he just light up the sky with scrolling announcements? He was God. Here's the reason. God's plan, apparently, all the way along, from the beginning of time itself, was for the gospel, the good news, to be spread through human witness. That was the plan. Among the very last things Jesus said, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before he ascended into heaven, he said, you will be my witnesses. That's the plan. John Piper, pastor and writer, says, without a witness... No one believes. Without a witness, no one believes. Which brings me to another question. If that's God's plan, if that's why John the Baptist was sent, to bear witness to the light, if that's why we are here, then we are all witnesses. The poster was right. We are all witnesses. Just as the Baptist was sent by God to bear witness and to prepare the way, so we are sent to bear witness, to prepare the way for someone, for someone to receive 
their Savior. Ask yourself, who am I preparing the way for in my life right now? How am I a witness? We all bear witness to something. John the Baptist was the witness. Secondly, John the Baptist had a message. We're talking about the message. A couple of years ago, I got to know a gentleman here at Chapel Street. Um, he since has moved away. His job took him somewhere else. But at the time, he was an executive with um, a company that made those, makes those big windmills, those big air, uh, the wind power things you see all around. Uh, when you, if you drive down into Indiana, they're in the farms, and maybe in southern Illinois, they're all over the place. But he worked for the company that made those. Um, and one day, we were having coffee. I was just getting to know him, and he mentioned that just the previous week, he had been invited specifically to join a discussion group of people in the energy industry at the White House. That got my attention. You know, often talk to somebody who's been in the White House. But he was asked to meet um, with all these other energy company executives in the White House with the president. At that time, the president was President Obama. And I was really, really curious about how these meetings go. So I was asking him all kinds of questions. What was it like? When did he come in? What, you know, what, what, how does that work? And one of the things he said was that, that there were about 12 to 15 people sitting around this really formal table in this, uh, this room in the White House from all over the country, really important people. And they all got there early, right, because you're meeting with the president. You want to be the one not walking in late. And they were led to this room and just told to wait, that he would be there in a minute. And he said about five minutes before the meeting was supposed to start, this, um, an official uh, of some capacity uh, walked into the room and said, um, the president is going to be a few minutes late. So everybody just waited a little bit longer. And a few minutes went by, and then the same guy came back and stood in the doorway and said, the president is now arriving. That's all he said. And when he said that, uh, that at that announcement, everyone in the room stood up. It was like the protocol. They all stood prior to him getting there because he said at, the, at that announcement, he said you could feel the presence. He, no, he did, couldn't really explain it, but he said you could feel the presence and power of the presidency coming into the room well before the man actually got there. In a sense, that official was a witness, and his message prepared the way. Verse 7, John writes, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So the Baptist's purpose was that all might believe through him. I was reading this this week, and I just noticed, well, who does the him refer to in that sentence? Because it works either way. Through him, as in through John the Baptist and his testimony, or through him, as in the light of the world coming, Jesus. Well, most scholars I read think it refers to the witness of John the Baptist, emphasizing the, 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 the importance of witness. But it works either way, because what he was bearing witness to was Jesus himself. But here's the question. Believe what? What's the content of the message? What did the Baptist preach? We pick it up again. Verse 29, chapter 1 of John. The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, that's the Baptist again, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So, the Baptist message is very clear. Jesus is both the Son of God and the Lamb of God. Let's take the Son of God first. For centuries, the Jewish people had waited for the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah. They all knew the great text from Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. John is saying, this is the light, Jesus of Nazareth. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So both John the Apostle and John the Baptizer are announcing that the arrival of this promised son is taking place. And this one will bring light to the darkness of the world. He would be born to rule as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And if we jump to Matthew's gospel, to Matthew's account of the great story of Christ's birth, we see another witness. Look at these, listen to these familiar words and see if you can see. I put these verses in red so you can see it. Matthew writes in chapter 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw, there it is, for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the wise men from the east bore witness to King Herod, even when it was very risky to do so, which they found out later. They bore witness to a child that was born to be king. Secondly, John bears witness, the Baptist bears witness, that Jesus is also the Lamb of God. In verse 29 he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this was a shocking thing for him to say in that culture at that time. For again, the Jewish people knew there was only one way for sin to be atoned for, and that was through blood. That's what the Day of Atonement was all about. When the high priest would go into the most holy place in the temple and offer a sacrifice of blood that would cover the sins of the people. So what John is saying is that Jesus is the promised son. Jesus is the promised Messiah of God. Jesus is the lamb whose blood will atone for the sins of the world. Hebrews chapter 9 says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. You know, this also shows up in the, in the Christmas, what we call the Christmas story. Matthew chapter 1, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's to Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall give, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Which means, Jesus is the light of the world in, a, in at least four ways. And I like to recount these four ways as often as I can. In Jesus, we receive, by faith, a new heart, through the forgiveness of sin. In Jesus, by faith, we receive new identity by being chosen, adopted by God as part of his great family. In Jesus, by faith, we receive new purpose that is to live and serve in his kingdom as made present in the world through the church. In Jesus, we receive, by faith, new destiny, and that is to live and serve and reign forever with Jesus in the new heaven and new earth. Heart, identity, purpose, and destiny. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of Advent. That's the message of John the Baptist. That's the message of John the Apostle who writes this to us. Now I want to go back to a very familiar story. We started in John the Apostle, and now I'm going to go to Luke chapter 2. You'll recognize these words. You'll probably hear them again this month. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Pause. We know some things about shepherds in that day. Historians tell us that the shepherds of that day, first century Israel, uh, they were seen as um, sort of outcasts. Their, their profession, what they did, required them to work with animals. and Often they were, they were defiled by blood and by uh, dead flesh. And so that made them unclean according to Jewish ceremonial law. So the shepherds were not allowed to go worship with everybody else in the temple. They were also seen as sort of, uh, sort of low-class, blue-collar workers. The most insignificant of people of the time. 
um, the lowest of the low, the shepherds. Shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Notice the theme there is light and darkness, and they were filled with great fear. Now here's a shocking surprise. This is the glory of God. This is the, the, the holiness of God made tangible and visible, the Shekinah glory of the Almighty God, and it comes to the most insignificant of people, people not even allowed to come into his presence in the holy temple, the lowest of the low. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. But the story doesn't end. I'm particularly fascinated by this last paragraph, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And notice this, these verses in red. And when they saw it, they made known, how? Witness. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds of all people had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, as it had been told them. You've heard that story before. You're going to hear it again. But here's what I want you to think about. The shock of the story which we struggle to hear, is that the God of the universe, the mighty and holy God, decides to enter the darkness and brokenness of this world. When he does that, he chooses to give that good news to shepherds. He comes in the form of a child born to a woman. That's a strange enough idea. But then he gives the news of the birth to shepherds? That can't possibly be the plan. Can it? We all bear witness to many things. You know, you see a good movie, you read a good book, you bear witness, you tell a friend. Hey, have you checked out this book? Have you read this book yet? You should read this book. It's a great book. Or you see a good game. Any Ohio State fans here? <laughs> Maybe a few. Or that Bears game the other night. What was that about? Right? And we bear witness. Hey, did you see the game? You see a great sale at a store, you pass it on to a friend. You have a great meal at a restaurant. Hey, I'll, you should go try that restaurant. We bear witness all the time. This is what John the Gospel writer is telling us. John the Baptist was sent by God as a witness to what he saw, to, what, to who Jesus was, in order to prepare the way. The shepherds were chosen by God to receive the message so they could bear witness to what they had seen and heard. And they prepared the way. And we too. You and me. We are witnesses. If. We are witnesses if we bear witness to who Jesus is and to what we have seen and heard. Bear witness. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that we are all here today, every single one of us, because someone, somewhere, sometime in our lives bore witness to who you are. Someone shared the love, the truth, and the grace of Jesus. Someone prepared the way for us to come to faith. And now, we are your witnesses. Help us by your Spirit to be faithful and clear and bold. In your name we pray. Amen.